thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Helen Heap. I am going to be facilitating the session this afternoon. Uh, I have a finance background. I was a professional investor in the UK, specializing in Japanese equities uh, for over 20 years. Uh, I've worked for a life insurance company. I've worked for Goldman Sachs. I've worked for a hedge fund. Um, so I've done sort of capitalism, red in tooth and claw, uh, in all its glory. Uh, I then woke up one morning and realized that actually there are other ways of doing things and that there are, there are things that capitalism doesn't do very well. And um, so I made a decision uh, in 2010 that I wanted to try and apply the skills and the knowledge that I'd acquired through that career in a more socially useful way. Uh, so since then, I've spent my time researching the social finance market in the UK and trying to figure out where the gaps in that market are and how we go about filling those gaps. Um, I now run my own social enterprise based in Liverpool in the north of England, uh, which is all about trying to find long-term patient risk capital for social enterprises and to find funding that meets the needs of uh, social organisations more generally. Um, so the, the title is, uh, is very pertinent to the work that I do. Um, and um, so, so my work is basically trying to, to match investors who are socially motivated and who have money to invest with social organisations who have a sustainable and viable business model uh, where they need funding to make that work and to try and take it to sustainability and to grow their business and to grow the social outcomes that they can deliver. So that's me. Um, I'm now going to pass the microphone to Isaac and he's going to tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you. My name is Isaac Holman and um, I'm a Gates Scholar starting in 2013. Um, here to talk mainly about Medic Mobile. It's a nonprofit tech company I helped found and we equip healthcare workers with mobile technology to provide better care and reach more people. And uh, the area of my research broadly is innovation studies. First, I was in the sociology department. I'm now at the business school. And I focus in particular on human-centered design as a process for making technologies uh, more use useful and uh, human-centered and achieving global health equity. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Julia Fan Lee. I started here in 2008 as a Gates Scholar at Johns. Um, and like some others in the room, I started as an MPhil and then went on to a PhD. But that wasn't really the plan. Uh, the plan was to come move here from Canada, um, get an MPhil, and then transition into the European pharmaceutical industry, which had been my childhood dream for a very, very long time. Um, got the nice job uh, in Basel in Switzerland, uh, but then uh, since it was an internship, I spent the rest of that summer um, in 2009 uh, in Rwanda. And I realized that healthcare innovation and the way it's funded is very different in Canada, as it is in the UK and in Rwanda, and then actually uh, turned down the job and stayed on for a PhD in innovative finance for global health for another three years uh, here in Cambridge. And it's really great to be back. And along with Julia, I joined in 2008 as a Gates Scholar. My name is Noah Isserman. I'm currently a professor of business administration and social work at the University of Illinois, where I spend a lot of time coordinating systems to support um, social entrepreneurship and work like that, particularly on the finance and non-financial service support. So that will be fun. And I think that's my most recent role, but I come to this sort of with a background in strategy work with a number of social purpose organizations, 40 or 50, and a number of foundations across Europe who provide the sort of finance we'll be talking about. So I'm really delighted to be here with you guys. Okay, thank you. Um, so what we thought we'd do, we have um, just over an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes, something like that. Um, the, the, the topic um, actually is the, the, the title of a paper that I wrote with a colleague, um, which um, my colleague is a, a social enterprise practitioner of some 20 odd years standing in the UK. And uh, he had, uh, uh, ha has applied over the years for pretty much every single stream of funding you could imagine that's available to social organizations in, in the UK. Uh, but was getting very frustrated that, that most of the money that was available to him just didn't do the job he needed it to do, which was to grow what is a, a successful social organization delivering social outcomes on a regular basis. Uh, but it just was not providing the patient enough capital that, that was required to do some of the, um, the sort of 
heavy lifting of you know, R&D, scoping out markets, finding the markets, finding your customers, understanding what the right price is for a product. Um, so he and I got together, um, he comes from a social enterprise background, I came from a financial background. We tried to sort of put our collective expertise uh, into the pot to try and understand what was going on in the UK. Uh, and we came up with this question, can social finance meet social need? Because the evidence available to us at that time, and this was in 2012, 2013, it didn't seem a very optimistic scenario that that would ever happen. Um, so that's, that's, that's the sort of genesis of, of why this subject um, is, is here for discussion today. So what, what we thought we'd do is we'd just run through some of the key uh, concepts, uh, just to sort of make sure that we're, we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and then um, the, the three panelists here have got some very interesting case studies, and um, I don't know whether anyone's seen Isaac's TED Talks. Um, I would heartily recommend them if you haven't. But, but there are some real, um, real live examples here of, of acts, f finance in action and social enterprise in action. Uh, so we want to give you a flavor of what happens out there in, in real life and what some of the issues are. Um, and we want as much involvement from you guys as possible. So please do feel free to put your hand up or to, to ask any questions or make any observations as we go along. Uh, we want this session to be to be your session. Uh, this is not, not just about us. So if we can start, uh, first of all, so um, first of all, if we just talk about what social enterprise is and what we mean by that. Um, and I think, Isaac, you were going to do that? Sure. So the um, term entrepreneurship or entrepreneur gets thrown a lot around just in common conversation is sort of somebody started a business. Uh, and that's one way to think about it, but in a little more nuanced perspective, um, researchers of entrepreneurship talk about it as a distinctive kind of change making. And uh, one of the important characteristics is um, shifting resources from areas of lower productivity to higher productivity. So you're creating value in that way. And another characteristic um, that's often associated with entrepreneurial activity is um, if, you, if you create a model for shifting resources to areas of higher productivity, it's often replicated. So you create an ecosystem of kind of copycat organizations that are um, working in a similar model. And um, so if you take this kind of idea to social entrepreneurship, um, you're not talking just about somebody who started an organization that works on a social issue. Um, you're talking about a distinctive way of pursuing social change. It's not quite the same as being a for-profit or being a non-profit. I would argue that there are perhaps as many serious non-profit social enterprises as there are social enterprises that are incorporated as for-profits. Um, and so some of the characteristics to look for with social enterprises are um, some kind of direct action. You provide a, a service or a product or some kind of good. Um, you're doing so in a way that's fundamentally more productive than what was available before. You're shifting resources. And um, in the most high impact cases, y you've discovered a way to shift resources so that there's uh, higher productivity activities for social good that then get replicated out into a whole new ecosystem a new way of, it, of engaging in social change. Um, so it's this combination of direct action. Um, you're not necessarily relying only on policy change or you know, government action, but they can be replicated at a very large scale. Um, and some, some common tactics for going about this include um, different ways of gaining revenue um, and, and thinking about different models for scale. Um, so rather than the traditional soup kitchen model, donation in, bowl of soup out, you might engage in different forms of having customers, um, for example. Again, that could be as a nonprofit organization or a for-profit. Um, so that's my take. Feel free to, to add on as you will. Um, so I'll carry on the thread of thinking of social entrepreneurship with what is social finance. Um, if we think about finance itself, it's really about how we match the funding that we require for a specific action, value, or in this case of the entrepreneur, what they want to make or cr move from lower productivity to higher productivity. Uh, sometimes that needs an accelerator, and mostly that comes in the form of finance. So if we think about how financing is done in everyday life, we can think of the university setting uh, where activities like research are financed by grants. 
Uh, they're financed by government. They're financed still sometimes by the European Commission mm -hmm. here in the UK. And that's a way of moving government resources to specific points of need in research when you write a grant to explain why this is needed and necessary. In business, we can think of finance, whether you are a Kiva loan recipient uh, setting up a, a bread shop, you need $50 in microloans, that will help you buy the machinery to make the bread to then sell out the door. You need the accelerator, again, this is finance. That finance can come in many forms. If you have savings yourself, you can finance it yourself. If it's something that you can go to the bank for a loan, that's a bank loan, another form of finance. Or you have outside equity investors, that's another form of finance where they will give you uh, advanced of cash and in exchange for a slice or a proportion of the entrepreneur's value or equity in that business. So its financing covers many areas, it impacts all of our everyday lives, and even at the sort of macroeconomic level, you can think about governments and the way our roads are financed, transportation, some of the basic public goods, um, and perhaps here in the UK, the NHS as a big social good in the healthcare realm. That's financed uh, many times when governments don't have enough tax receipts to finance certain public projects. They can look to the uh, sovereign bond markets where they go to the capital markets and UK uh, being a very well developed country has a lower cost of borrowing from the capital markets to finance its public needs than perhaps some other developing countries. So all these forms of finance are inherent in our everyday lives. So how does social finance make things different? Um, for me, that really is another lens or a perspective to look through the window pane. You can look at social finance in, um, in a, a straightforward government setting where you're having low cost of borrowing as a solid government. The more stable you are, the lower the cost of borrowing, the, more, the cheaper it is for you to finance public goods. Maybe that is social finance to some people. It definitely is for those at the Treasury here. <laughs> Um, their borrowing costs have gone up recently, some of you may have read. Um, another form of social finance is where um, those with savings um, can directly tell funds that they invest in, whether it's your pension funds or your children's um, education funds, and say, I only want to do socially responsible investing as an investor. I then cut through my funds using this perspective and out of say 500 funds I want to invest my pension in, maybe there are 30 funds that are specifically socially responsible and they make it a mandate to say we don't invest in things that are arms based or extractives based um, or will engage in um, potential like war, war trade uh, or arms trades and things like that. And then pr on this sort of micro level, you have social financing of entrepreneurs as well um, that n are necessary sometimes as a blend um, to be risk adjusted to the entrepreneur's efforts. So if you can get grant financing, that would be great. If you can get your a lower cost of form um, of a bank loan or debt or higher costs of capital of financing in the external investors, all of these can be done with a social perspective, um, depending on how you you cut and select your parameters of as an investor and also as a, a recipient. Um, but my hypothesis is that for social finance to work, you really need the fundamental principles of finance as alone to be sound. Um, and that's where we get into the thoughts about sustainability versus profitability um, and how we need finance as a basic level to work uh, to make sure you're matching sources of financing with the risk that you're taking on as the endeavor. So I'll pass it on to Noah here. Thank you. And I think Julia did a really fantastic job there. So I'll just add actually two things, so two sort of spectra to think about in this whole conversation. So when we're talking about providers of finance here, we've talked about the sort of you know red and tooth and claw capitalism side. We've talked about pure grants. You know, it's literally free money um, with no strings attached. But I think increasingly, and over the last 20 or 30 years, for the first time at a large scale, there are sort of various blended models along that spectrum, right? Some investors, um, and by investor, I mean just literally a provider of money, you know, will say, I only care about social outcomes, therefore a grant is the most appropriate mechanism. 
Others will say, right, they only care about the highest return possible. And I think, and Julie did a really good job of talking through some of the places in between that profit first or impact first. And as you move down that spectrum, there are increasingly sort of new intermediaries that are developing. I think that's probably where we'll spend quite a lot of our time today is just talking about how those are shifting over time in the same way as if you wanted to achieve a commercial aim 40 years ago, they're really like the concept of say venture capital didn't exist, whereas, or at least not in a meaningful way. Whereas now it's an entire broad ecosystem with funds that specialize at every point in the growth of a young company through to the point where it's a very large company and brings in other new kinds of funding. You know, it's a sort of five or six stage process at this point. I think we're in the early days in the social finance world still of figuring out what those sort of pathways start to look like. I think that's probably the thing we'll talk about um, quite a lot here. And I think that lastly, just to echo one of, one of Isaac's points about when we talk about corporate forms, right? That fundamentally the, the primary difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit of whatever kind, right, is that if you generate extra cash in a nonprofit, you have to reinvest it in the mission. Whereas if you generate extra cash in a for-profit, you can pay it out as you see fit, usually to those who own the company. So I think like that's a just important final distinction to draw. And we will pass it back to Helen now. So I think one of the um, um, the issues there is uh, the um, as as No just mentioned how if you have got a successful organisation what do you do with any surplus or profit that is is generated by that and um, that's something which the, there's uh, the, the social organisations in the UK sometimes really struggle with that it's you know it is it is profit. I came from the financial world and I, I naively started talking the language of finance in social organizations and wow, that's a, that's a big shock. You get a wake up call when you start doing that. Profit is a really dirty word for many, many social organizations. Uh, certainly in the UK, I'm, I'm not sure whether that applies internationally as well. But it, it, and it's a real problem because you really need to be able to understand and, and get across the message that if you don't generate some sort of surplus from your activity, you're not going to survive. That is an absolute critical principle. So, you know, um, Julia mentioned that, that we need to be able to apply the principles of finance in the social world. And that is one of the most basic ones that, yes, you have to be able to provide your service and you have to be able to cover your costs. But actually, you need to be able to do more than that as well, because if you're not generating something on top of that, you're not going to be able to do the development work that you need. You're not going to be able to go out and research new markets. You're not going to be able to pay somebody to go out and find your new markets, pay a salesperson or a marketing person or whatever it might be. So you absolutely need to have a cushion on top of the sort of basic survival that an organization needs in order to be able to develop your social organization and to take it further. So the, the, the issue of, of sustainability and, and, and being able to build into your business model something which enables you to grow and to do that development is something which is actually anathema to a lot of social organizations. And the way charities are structured here in the UK, you, you often get penalized if you do generate a surplus. You are, you know, you're not allowed to sit with great big reserves. We've had a number of very high profile examples in the UK over the last uh, year or, or, or two of organizations that have not been deemed to be using their finances appropriately. Um, and sometimes that's because they haven't had enough money, which is one problem. But sometimes it's because they're, they're, um, they're not using money in a way that is deemed consistent with the mission. And what that means, what that consistency with mission means, sometimes can be very difficult to, um, to, to articulate for people who are purely socially focused. You, you know, it is entirely appropriate for an organization within the social world to be able to go out and find new clients that can benefit from their service or uh, new people who are prepared to pay for that service. Uh, but how do you actually achieve that is something which sometimes can be really, really difficult. Um, so um, I hope we've sort of laid the scene in terms of, of what some of the issues are. So I think now the best way of just really getting to grips with this is if we can go into some real life examples of um, the work that these guys have been doing out there um, on the ground, uh, and we'll we'll try and bring it alive for you. So I don't know who, who would like to start. Do you want to start either, or shall we? Cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Medic Mobile, and 
maybe you know personal experience one organization and then you guys can expand that out to some of the systems at play here um, medic mobile started as a um, student project basically in um, Lewis and Clark in Stanford I met my co-founder online actually uh, no it wasn't on eHarmony but um, <laughs> through a kind of very nerdy global health listserv actually <laughs> and um, since then it's it's grown quite a lot you know this was in 2008 around Thanksgiving we decided to work together and now medic mobile employs um, more than 50 people uh, we've worked in more than 20 countries our our annual budget is a, a few million dollars and um, what you know so that's it's been a wild ride it's been a great experience and part of that experience has been um, learning to care about revenue and for me it really like hit home when I started having personal relationships, coworkers, employees, who, who I had offered a job and who I really cared about and who were delivering great work, um, people who had families, some of them are single working parents. Um, and when you're, you're a growing organization and you're winning awards and then you're looking at the spreadsheet and it's like, we have two months till bankruptcy, <laughs> um, you really care about revenue. And so, so over time, we've become very creative about how to get revenue to fund our work. The big idea is that even if you look at the, the communities where access to healthcare is the worst, um, where, where it's people really struggle to access dignified services and, and really where people are struggling the basics of survival, you find that there are care providers in a lot of those communities. They're often under-resourced. Um, Brick and mortar, you know, physical hospitals will often be far away, um, some, and sometimes that's the primary reason people fall ill, don't receive care quickly enough, and have really bad outcomes. But in a lot of these communities, there are community-based health workers. These are often lay people who have received on-the-job training. In the best programs, they're salaried and well supported, but in many programs, they're just volunteers. Uh, and they can become as disconnected from the formal health system as the people they're trying to connect. And our basic idea was that, you know, if you follow around what these people do a day, every day, a lot of it is walking and waiting. The, the main advantage of community-based healthcare workers is that they go where the patients are. And so in that context, if you imagine putting a phone in the hand of every single health worker, they're really dramatic opportunities to support them better, to enable them to ask advice so that they provide higher quality care, just to make their work more efficient so that they can um, share you know, with a nurse at a central facility what it is they're doing without having to walk or ride a bicycle 20, 30, 50 miles. And um, so when we first started these projects, um, you know, I, I had a, a small fellowship, so did my co-founder, and we were kind of using that for, for very modest living expenses and then all these computers and, and phones and project expenses. Um, and we had a project that was going really well in Malawi, and um, somebody showed up one day on a Sunday. I still remember, because I was in gym shorts and flip-flops, and he was like, we've heard about this mobile phone project. Could you show us? Um, so I, I gave him a tour of how we were exchanging text messages with this group of a little more than 100 community-based health workers. And he asked about the different types of data we're, we were collecting. You know, could you also do structured data like forms or surveys and integrate that in this messaging inbox? And I was saying, yeah, technically it would look like this or that. And, and then he said, you know, we'd like to do something like this in the south of Malawi. Could you come help us set up a project? And I, and I thought about it and I said, yeah, actually, because this one's gotten pretty stable, and I have a few more months of my fellowship, which was supposed to be a gap year in between undergrad and medical school. And um, so he said, great, you know, let us know what you charge, and, and we'll work something out. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll get back to you on that, <laughs> and let's be in touch. Um, so I was like, he had money for this stuff. Whoa. You know, no idea. And so I, so I emailed my co-founder. I was like, what do we charge if we're consultants? And he's like, I don't know. Make it up. And so, and so this is a very good example of what not to do. I took the, the total um, amount of my fellowship, which is a one-year fellowship, um, and I divided it by 365. 
And, and then I told him that was my daily rate. So this was like a poverty wage to begin with. <laughs> and, I, and without realizing it, I had calculated, which was actually true, that I was working seven days a week with no holidays and no sick days. Um, and so, but that was the beginning of a revenue model. And that's in, <laughs> right? In our particular case, we realized that we could expand on this idea, put a phone in the hand of every health worker much more quickly by building on the infrastructure of these existing healthcare organizations. And now our most common model is a public-private partnership. So we work closely with a care provider that's a permanent part of the local healthcare system. In most cases, that's a ministry of health. And then there's usually another uh, partner, often an international NGO, that has some kind of budget for improving healthcare, but they usually don't have the technical expertise that we do. Um, and, and so, you know, the three organizations will work together to deliver these projects that are improving maternal health, immunizations, disease surveillance, malnutrition projects, a number of different other use cases um, in a pretty big way. We've, we've equipped more than 12,000 health workers so far. And these people are responsible for the care of more than 7 million people. And as I said before, that's across 20 countries. So we've worked mostly in Africa, but we have pretty big projects. In, various parts of South Asia and in Latin America as well. Um, after a while when we, you know, we were doing project after project with these existing open source technologies and, and all of our work, you know, we've been a nonprofit from the beginning. Every, every technology we use is accessible, free to the public. Uh, but we started seeing limitations in, in what was already available and um, big opportunities to improve the tools that, that we have for global health and um, basically no, no money with which to do that. And um, what we ended up finding was, thanks in, to a large extent to one particular mentor at the Malago Foundation, was the impact investing community. And you know, this is, this is a, a movement within the philanthropic community that is um, taking some lessons learned from how venture capital works. Um, how venture capital invests in and fosters innovation. And in some cases, this community is doing um, actual investments where they um, expect either full repayment of the money or they expect some return. Um, very often, and this is always the case with us, they are just giving grants, but they're doing so in a model that's very different to traditional philanthropy. So rather than um, putting out a call for proposals, asking people to send in their proposals about how you're going to address X, Y, and Z problem. What they do is they look for art promising organizations that they think they can scale up their impact. And they, they grill everything about us. So they sit in on board meetings, they look at all of our finances, they interview key staff, often they'll visit um, sites where we've implemented projects, and they look at our organization holistically. You know, rather than a paper application about what we say we can do, they visit what we're currently doing, and then at the end of the day, it's thumbs down or thumbs up. And the typical model is that these organizations will give us between $100,000 and $250,000 a year, and most of them make multi-year commitments. So some of them, we've had that sum of money every year for six years. And this is the, the kind of funding that organizations need to pursue innovation. And so the way that shakes out now is, for the last few years, roughly 50% of our budget has been grants from this impact investing community, and that goes primarily towards developing open source tools um, that are then you know, a freely available public good, and we can deliver them to global health organizations at no cost. And then our activities to support implementation, so you know, actually installing software and hardware and training health workers, that we, our, our revenue model is charging these existing ecosystem of, of healthcare providers. So, so that's you know, one example. Um, I think that this kind of model, where you have some earned income and some philanthropic money, but on a more investing type model, it's, it's growing quickly. It's becoming more and more common. And in general, I, I think that's a good thing. Um, We've considered, you know, seriously at several points, spinning out a for-profit wing, and doing, uh, you know, a round of venture capital. We feel like we'd have access to more money, um, but then we'd have to make more of a return. And 
so every time we've considered it, it, it was there were merits, but it wasn't quite worth it for us to do a full-on, you know, for-profit wing that we could sell equity shares. Um, b usually because we had a sense that it would change our customer base. So we'd, we, we'd end up having to lean towards not just paying clients, but clients who could play, pay more, uh, as opposed to what we have now are kind of paying clients and then organizations serving the poorest of the poor um, who we basically cross-subsidize so that we still get to work with them as part of our, our you know, mission of health equity. So that's, that's my perspective, and I, I think hopefully I've prov provided a concrete case people can think about. There are a lot of organizations that are pursuing innovation and need to invest in it in a more strategic, long-term way, uh, and that are also exploring with generating revenue through, through their activities. Um, and maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Sure. Thanks. I'll just share with a couple of questions. So, um, that was really fascinating. Thanks, Isaac, and um, a really great example, I think. Um, can I just ask you, the, the holistic approach that you found from Malago, did you, is that something which brings the organization along in a much faster way to a much greater degree than it would do otherwise? Do you think so? Is that in itself a part of the package that they're offering you and something which you find um, helps the way that you develop? Absolutely. I think there's an attitude among a lot of people in that community that uh, organizations that really deserve to grow, s social change or social purpose organizations that really deserve to grow, often have to struggle on for years, more than a decade even, before they um, get to a size where they can really have the impact that they ought to have and that that can be accelerated. Another common opinion that goes with that is that um, the traditional philanthropy model doesn't allow ineffective organizations to fail. And so what you find is by the time you're a nonprofit with a dozen employees and you're kind of, you're, you're doing something that matters to somebody and you might be, relatively speaking, pretty mediocre at it, like not the most effective model, but once you, you have a story to tell, you have concrete projects and you can you know, send the, the hat around, organizations are able to get enough money to to keep surviving and that that's actually in some ways problematic that's money that could be more effectively repurposed towards organizations that have bring incredible insight and and rigor to their work um, so you know around half of our budget now comes from these impact investors who um, all talk to each other you know, they're colleagues and they all, they all, these funds all know each other. And in many cases, it's in the second or third year um, of an organization funding us, seeing the, the impact we deliver, that they go, wow, you're, you're really doing what I hoped you would. I'm gonna introduce you to my friend. And, and so then we get another funder on the similar model. Similarly, I've seen organizations that screw up badly. And sometimes they have a leadership transition that doesn't work out, or they have a project that goes poorly and they respond poorly to it going poorly, um, or something about their, their model emerges that's problematic. Um, and with this kind of funder, they're people who have the expertise to actually walk away and say, yeah, we're, we're not funding this anymore. And so organizations can actually close their doors and, and that, um, money can be repurposed to an organization that, that will be more effective. Um, and then just picking up on the comment you made about you considered traditional venture capital mm -hmm. type uh, approach, um, I guess one of the cruxes of the questions um, that, and certainly some of my work is, is working towards this, but ultimately what we need is social investors who are investing purely for the social outcomes, or sorry, primarily for social outcomes, and therefore, if we can have an approach where it's a venture capital type model, but where the outputs that the investor are looking for are the social outcomes rather than the financial returns, mm -hmm. that would be what I think a lot of us would be really, really interested in. Mm -hmm. So you've clearly considered taking the venture capital m approach and rejected that because <laughs> your expectation that the financial returns would be too great and that would change your organization. In the journey that you've had so far and the investors you've come across so far, do you think there are social investors out there for whom 
the social outcomes are the most important and therefore we could try and morph that VC model into something where the social outcomes are the primary outcome and we can take the, the basics of the model but it's social rather than financial. Absolutely, I think that's very promising. And one of my lenses for this is working with the Equine Green Fellowship, which is a really fantastic two-year fellowship for seed stage social entrepreneurs. And in addition to being part of that fellowship, I've now been on the uh, committee of judges for several years. Um, and this, this year was my first year in the finalist round. So I, it's in some ways sort of a business plan competition. I see a lot of plans come through, and then I'm discussing with these other judges. And some are incorporated as nonprofits, some as for-profits. Quite a few have both or intend at some point to have a hybrid structure. And so one of the things we talk about is if you're looking at debt financing or financing from a, from in a purely selling equity model that expects returns, um, what are you going to do if you experience that pressure? And often it depends on pretty detailed ways about the specific issue area in which they work. Um, and just to give one example that's kind of easy, um, I know a, a friend who runs an organization that's uh, related to mobile banking. There are a lot more intuitive ways to monetize that than there are with healthcare for the poorest of the poor. And so, so my personal take on it is that there will always be an important role for genuine philanthropy, um, for, for money um, that has no strings attached and no expectation of return. However, um, changing the way that we do finance and, and having a bigger opportunities for social finance, that doesn't need to be seen as gobbling up charities. Um, that can be seen as charities learn something from this, but uh, you know, I'd rather see social finance gobble up non-social finance. That's kind of my, my skin in the game. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Isaac. Julia, perhaps you can give us your examples? Sure. Uh, that was a great Q&A. Um, I came in today and I saw the flip chart, so uh, since there is one, I will use it. <laughs> um, so I have uh, three and a half uh, little projects to share, um, all of which actually started uh, during my time here with Gates and at Cambridge, and then all three of which I am intimately now going to be involved with for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, so the first one is, is it wobbling? GHIF. Um, so that's, this stands for the Global Health Investment Fund. And for those of you um, on your phones, ghif.com uh, takes you straight there. Um, this started when I came back from Rwanda uh, to start my PhD. And um, the idea is that if all of us here today in this room put a uh, investor hat on. I know this might not be our daily hat, but if all of us were to pool our, say, pension savings and say we have a pool of money, um, and this goes to Helen's question of what does VC models look like with social impact as the key metric, and this pool of money, say we wanted it to have social outcome and we wanted to adopt the VC model, we would invest into what is uh, usually called a fund manager. So this fund manager would help search, due diligence, and execute, so invest in different uh, projects using this pool of capital. So this could be project A, B, C, D. And in the case of global health, for example, these diseases would be areas that traditional uh, Silicon Valley investors wouldn't be interested in. So things like TB, HIV, cholera, uh, onchocerciasis or river blindness. And so this fund manager, in a traditional sense, this looks like a normal VC model. You give it a pool of capital, the fund manager selects um, over a period of five to seven years. If they're successful, the investments will return back money to the fund. The fund then redistributes back to us as the pensioners uh, by then. And um, we would then have this circuitous return, sort of model of investment and return. So uh, my PhD concentrated on the fact that this model did not exist for these diseases. Like I just didn't understand during my master's why it didn't exist. So um, because we're part of the Gates Scholars 
group, and we have a very wealthy benefactor. And our wealthy benefactor, uh, Bill and Melinda and Bill Sr., invest a large portion of their endowment, actually the majority, not with the scholars, but actually on global health, on US education, and on agriculture. Um, so I asked the Gates Foundation why they didn't do this, since they put $2 billion a year in terms of grant funding into these disease areas anyway. So isn't that part of the same mission? Aren't they looking for the same social outputs as they do on their philanthropic arm? Why don't they do this in their investment side? So at the Gates Foundation, there are two sides of the house. There's a side of the house that manages the endowment, that creates the investment income, and then goes to fund the foundation's work. So when I uh, went to visit the Gates Foundation um, in 2009, um, I was told by the legal team that the IRS, the IRS or the US tax law would not allow this. I thought that was pretty poor. I thought the lawyers could be more innovative than that. And uh, lo and behold, in, in 2009, 2010, uh, Bill Gates changed his mind and he set up an internal fund within the foundation of $400 million and four people. <coughs> when I last checked in 2015, so last year, this group has grown to 20 or so staff and they now have $1.5 billion to manage and to invest um, in areas which the foundation cares about. So the Global Health Investment Fund, um, we raised $108 million in 2012-2013 to m try and test this model. Now, in my s mind, this made a lot of sense, and um, the Bill had dinner with Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan, and JP Morgan was then sold on this idea, and they thought we could ask our JP Morgan clients to invest, and we would get $100 million in 24 hours. This was the plan after this dinner that Bill and Jamie had. And so I thought it was a great plan because then we'd get to work and invest. Um, but the actual fundraising took over 18 months. <laughs> it was actually very difficult to explain to a traditional group of investors why investing in infectious diseases for disproportionately poor countries was a worthwhile endeavor and why they would get their money back in the future as well. So 18 months later, um, thankfully, we gathered enough investors. So we had individual investors, about 20 or so. And then we had about 13 institutional investors. So these are companies like GSK and Merck and pension funds like AXA and Storebrand um, out of the Nordics. Uh, so this fund is ongoing. And um, we've made uh, over six investments to date. Um, when I say we, I should clarify that um, as of last year, the fund moved to New York City. And um, I'm no longer with the fund, but I'm very close <coughs> still to the entrepreneurs that I funded uh, in my time there. Um, I got married and decided to stay in London, so that was also good. But um, I was very sad to see it go, but what's great about <coughs> finance is that I know it's set up, um, the investments are ongoing, and it's standing on its own two feet. And perhaps I'll just give um, an example of the cholera example. Um, we, that was our second investment. We had a $6 million loan to a South Korean manufacturer. At that time, you can think of it as a startup. Uh, they've never been in the life sciences business before, but they were all uh, engineering, uh, manufacturing engineers who were very good at making things. And so they got a piece of intellectual property to make cholera vaccine. And at the time, um, there was a breakout uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, and there wasn't enough cholera vaccine supply in the world, because there was only one company that made it. And they only made 3 million doses a year. That was the maximum capacity they had. And other businesses didn't want to go into that business area, because they didn't think it was profitable. <coughs> so what we worked together with the South Koreans was to say, well, the intellectual property is public knowledge. We will give you a, a a low cost loan for you to buy the manufacturing equipment. And then you will work hard using your engineering knowledge to make sure it gets pre-approved by the World Health Organization. So 14 months later, they did get pre-approval from WHO. And in that time period, we've now doubled the world supply of cholera vaccines. So we've gone from 3 million to 6 million. We're still short of the 20 million or so doses needed, but it's a step in, in the right direction. Um, and over the same time that I was at Gates, um, I um, 
in contrast, started a project called the African Innovation Prize. Um, and this stems onto Isaac's point about how some organizations um, are really philanthropically tied and based. So African Innovation Prize is a business plan competition. It is specifically aimed at uh, youth entrepreneurs in African universities. We started in Rwanda. Uh, again, you can probably see where that started from um, in the circle of things. And um, over the last seven years, we've been running this competition, first from one university, and then now we're nationwide in Rwanda to over 20,000 uh, Rwandan students. And then we've also piloted in Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and in Burundi. So African Innovation Prize is still philanthropically funded. We're funded by a family office in the US, and we're funded by a UK FTSE-listed company called Delarue. Um, what's quite interesting is that Delarue's business is printing money and passports, and so we thought it was a really good corporate tie-in to fund a business plan competition to encourage youth entrepreneurs. And I just wanted to make a, a personal uh, comment at this point, which is, with GHIF, um, I'm really proud of that the fund has got off to a really great start. But for me, working as a fund manager, I knew that I had an impact in, in cholera, but I never could ever see the patients or, or the users. The cholera vaccines would then be purchased by UNICEF. UNICEF would be funded by the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, Gavi, and then they would distribute in over 197 countries. But I would, because I'm not a frontline clinician, I'm not a community health worker, I never really got to meet the patients. I would be this intermediary. However, with African Innovation Prize, even though it's a smaller project, um, I get to meet the entrepreneurs and the, the students who participate. I try to keep in touch every year. And what's been really nice this past summer is that one of our uh, winners in 2013, Jean Bosco, he was selected as a Nelson Mandela Fellow. So he met President Obama last summer. And this past month, he was on a panel in Silicon Valley with President Obama, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, a female entrepreneur from Egypt, and one other entrepreneur. It, it was just amazing. I open up um, social media and he's everywhere, right? John Bosco, the little 19-year-old student that sat at the back of our training in 2013 in, in Kigali. So two different projects, um, but again, illustrative of how finance can have uh, a social impact and meet that social need. Um, a second one here uh, that um, is called the Northwest Territories Heritage Fund. Um, so this is a project that started after I graduated um, in 2012 um, and lasted to about 2014, was the Northwest Territories Heritage Fund. It is a fund in the Northwest Territories of Canada. So for those of you who don't know where that is, it's mostly near the, the Arctic Circle, and it's the far north of Canada. It is a, a territory with about 14% of Canada's land mass and a population of about 41,000, so smaller than Cambridge. They have a huge amount of resources in oil, in gold, in diamonds, in natural gas, and as the Arctic evolves, the, the future of this territory will also evolve. And in 2012, the federal government of Canada decided to give more powers to this territorial government. It's a small government, and for the very first time, they would have control over their revenues, royalties from resources. And they didn't quite know how to manage all of the incoming revenue streams, but they had a very good role model to look at. And they looked at the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which comes from uh, Norway's oil industry, which back in the 70s, the government decided they would start collecting revenues and royalties from oil companies. And over time, uh, Norway has, the fund has grown uh, with compounding interest and investment returns to be over $873 billion. Um, for a little country of Norway with 5 million inhabitants, this very much secures a future uh, or goes a step towards securing a future where even if they run out of oil, they'll have other resources to rely on. And this leads to the concept of intergenerational equity. If we're making 
investments and returns today on resources that we as a generation have, what if it runs out for future generations? How can we better secure their future if we're taking these extractives today? Um, and so for this fund, we modeled it on governance rules of Norway and how this territory could help develop a fund that is safeguarded for, for future generations. Um, in 2013, the fund was launched, um, and in the first year, so the 2014 year, uh, they took 25% of their royalty revenues and they locked it in this heritage fund. So the hope is that the fund is untouchable for 20 years, the 25% a year keeps going into the fund, and the investment returns accumulate, and then in 20 years, hopefully that will grow into a good enough nest egg uh, for this territory and then continue on in the future to grow. As a comparison, we really have to be careful about the rules of social finance and safeguarding because if we compare, for example, another province in Canada, Alberta, they started a, a natural resource fund much the same time as Norway and Alberta also has a very large oil and uh, natural resources reserve. But Norway, we all know, is very uh, successful These um, with $800 billion. Alberta, unfortunately, the government, when they ran low <laughs> on tax receipts, they started digging into the fund earlier than they should have, um, and they currently only sit at $34 billion. So it's a big difference depending on how you safeguard finance and safeguard the assets that you're trying to preserve. And then so the last one I'll cover is something called the Cancer Mega Fund. Ooh. Um, this is another idea developed around 2012. That was a good year. Um, there was a paper published um, in Nature Biotechnology by a financial engineering professor called Andrew Lowe out of MIT Sloan. And he, as a hedge fund uh, researcher or a professor for many years, had lost his mother to cancer recently. And over his research, over the course of her treatment, he didn't understand why biomedical innovation was so stuck. And he found out that the cancer researchers um, didn't have enough resources to try out all of their ideas. Grants are competitive, um, starting companies is expensive, R&D is expensive. So he proposed that if we all pooled um, our funding together, we can create a mega fund. A mega fund, which again, like this model, can have a pool of capital, go into a fund manager, and then fund many, many more oncology projects. Perhaps the best way to illustrate this is um, just by asking a question in the room, and that is um, how many of us uh, have a pension account currently? You mean so. Retirement or pension specifically? Uh, retirement's good. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a general uh, savings pot. And how many of us, um, if I were to say, would you spare $2,000, pounds, euros of your pension today? Um, f to cure cancer, would you do that in 30 years and get your money back with a return? I know I would, and uh, many of you would too. And so the idea here is that if every you know, US household put in just $2,000 of their pension, retirement, educational savings into a mega fund idea that would go into cancer, we would have more than enough, um, about 20 to $30 billion worth, to create a cancer mega fund, which can then fund over 100 to 200 cancer compounds from beginning to completion. And so we know R&D is risky, we know cancer research is risky, not everything's going to work, but out of the three to 5% chance that it might, and out of the 100 to 200 compounds that you're funding to completion, there's a risk adjusted return here for the cancer mega fund. So all of these examples, I'm trying to illustrate that there's an opportunity for risk adjusted return, and it's all about how we best match those resources together with the projects. Thanks, Julia. Um, again, another great set of examples there. Um, can I take you back to your cholera example? And um, there you described what seemed to be a fairly straightforward, in the way you described it, I'm sure it was not quite as easy as you made out, um, but here's, here's a group of people that have, have an idea. 
uh, they've got the technology to make more vaccines. So a straightforward loan, um, I don't know what sort of terms that loan was offered on, whether it was um, soft terms or whether it was a, a commercial loan. Um, the lenders got their money back. We got more, we, we doubled the, the cholera vaccine um, supply and everybody's happy. Um, but then you went on to mention that we still have the gap. We now have six million vaccines. We still need 20 million vaccines. So the question, and it comes directly to the question we're asking here, can social finance meet social need? Has there been a phase two loan or other social finance provision to bridge that remaining 40 million gap? And can you sort of fill in the rest of the story or to sure. put us up to date? Um, that's a good question. Um, the way that we structured the cholera investment um, was two-part. So because we were able to invest in a company, we had a 50% um, a loan component, and we also had 50% in preferred equity. So as investors, we're tied into the long-term success of the company. We want them to succeed for the long term and provide cholera vaccine every year and not just shut down after they've hit some milestones and can um, cash out. So we're tied to the long-term investment of the company. And also, I should mention, in 14 months, we doubled the supply. But the loan and the equity preferred equity investment got them to invest in more machinery and higher capacity. So they're actually ramping up to 6 million doses a year. Um, that takes a bit more validation time. So that will take another year, year and a half for them to do that. And our hope with the investment is that we can show to other small, medium-sized enterprises or folks in other countries with engineering expertise that this can be done. So here we've shown it can be done in South Korea. It is a profitable market. There is a buyer. Um, and in this case, it's UNICEF via Gavi. And if you're thinking about starting a business, you can go into this space and there will be um, a profit for you to make and it's not all fruitless as before they looked at infectious diseases and nobody would touch it but we would say there's a sustainable business model here and that this would attract other companies to dive into this space to fill the gap and, and does it attract other funders as well so your original funder has sort of d doubled up or has, has continued but is it bringing in new funders as well I certainly hope so, because uh, this is also another reason why the fund um, moved uh, to New York. Um, the idea is that there would be now a second fund in the Global Health Investment Fund 2, and that it would be a larger fund and more investors would be attracted to the business model now that we've proven that it can work. Okay, well, with your leave on this, Helen, I think we've had really, really great examples so I, I also did this terribly, like horribly uncharitable thing and had three examples to share. I'm going to not do that. Um, I will share one cool example. But I think first, it might be a good idea to like, as we transition from here into like the broader discussion with, with me, I guess, if that's okay with you, um, to just sort of like clarify a little bit the systems that, that sort of work here. But like, if we're talking about these sort of systems of social need, right? Like we've talked about the needs, we've talked about investors, we've talked about intermediaries, we've talked about delivery organizations, and we've talked about eventual service users or beneficiaries, right? So like, it's a somewhat complicated system and maybe like, since we'll have a conversation about this right after, it might be a good idea to just sort of like, sketch that out really quick. So like, the whole thing is based on like these needs, right? But needs themselves are super, super tricky, right? So like, okay, who here volunteers? Like, like raise a hand like, like you mean it. Okay, so it seems like most people, who here gives money, like actually transfers money to a voluntary organization on purpose? Who here makes a significant transfer to such an organization? Say like multiple percentage points, say 5% even, of your annual income, such a thing. So this is actually like an unusually generous group to, to begin with, right? But like, so we all care about needs. But determining what needs matter, like in this group, Right? If we were to say, what is the most pressing social need in the United Kingdom right now? Like, I suspect there are what, there are 55 of us or something like that? I suspect we probably get what, like 45 answers, something like that, right? Like, this is fiendishly hard work to even identify the needs in the first place. And then when you're talking about, like, can social finance meet social need, this big question, you know, I think it's, you know, what finance, sure, but most importantly, like, like what? needs and who determines those things. So I think like, that's a really important piece. So, like as we then get into like the system of how these actually try to get met, right? So this 
Like this is like the, the underlying reason for all things. Um, and then as we jump into like what we're actually trying to do, right? So we have money. Um, I'm sorry, I'll be more sensitive. <laughs> I, I used to be better at drawing. <laughs> Sterling symbols are hard to draw. It's been, it's been a few years, um, right? But so we have this, like the first part, right? We actually have money. And that money can go one of two places. And right, so it can either go to an intermediary, right? Like what Julia just explained. Julia, I've read your website, but hearing you explain it, that's so awesome. That's so cool that you did that thing. Um, so, like, so there can be these sort of financial intermediaries, right, that do this work of deciding where to invest. And in the process, right, can provide these really valuable signals that Isaac was talking about, about you know, good companies and bad companies. But those are kind of easy to, to measure, right? Like, so if you think about it, like Facebook and LinkedIn, right, they're kind of similar. So who here like, thinks Facebook is the better bet for the future? If you, as an investor, like who would think like Facebook would have like made you more money in the last couple of years than LinkedIn? Is that okay? So and other people, LinkedIn right actually has a purpose. Professional people pay money. LinkedIn better bet. Okay. Well, this room is good. Good investors, right? It's like some of you guys would have like quadrupled your money. The rest of you guys would have lost a little bit of money. The Facebook people would have done really well, right? But we know that they've done better because they've actually either paid out more money, although they're both growth stocks, so, but their share price has been bid up, right? You can sell what you had for five times what you paid for it. So we know that it was better. But like in the absence of a bottom line in many of these places or of a blended return, right? That's really like a fiendishly difficult concept. And like acknowledging that as we head into our discussion is probably a really good thing, just sort of note, right? But then these organizations then actually, they're delivery organizations that actually do things, right? Like their companies, their social enterprises, their nonprofits. And sometimes the money goes straight to them, right? So this is actually how a lot of, say, governments fund things, right? We talk about social needs. Kind of, if you look at like the role of a government, it's pretty much to determine and address social needs, usually with some sort of democratic accountability process, like directly or representationally or another way to do that. You know, it's different in different countries, of course. Um, and some are much less democratic than others or much more, but like fundamentally, right? Like that's what a government kind of does. And in this process and this conversation about social needs, it's probably worth keeping in mind that like markets are big and markets are important, but when we talk about cash to meet social needs, say in a, in a country like the UK, it is overwhelmingly public money, right? And all of us here have ever paid taxes or anyone who buys something while we're here, right? We are already paying into that system. Um, and that system, in terms of choosing how we address social needs, functions very, very differently than an investment fund, right? And I think in that sort of big governmental system, we can vote in and vote out people who have priorities that we share. So it's a, you know, there's a time lag, it's not perfect accountability, but it is actually there. I think interestingly, a lot of what we've talked about is also philanthropic money, right? In every one of these examples, um, different kinds of investment from philanthropists, right? But I think that philanthropy itself, although it's radically important, and a lot of my, my research has been sort of looking at this, you know, say like foundations and trusts, right, have like worldwide sort of roughly quintupled how much money they have in the last 35 years. So like if you looked at the world economy, except for say like certain internet oriented subsectors, like philanthropy is growing faster than any other part of the world economy. It's an interesting way to think about it, right? But if philanthropy is literally taking private um, resources and projecting them into the public sphere to hit public demand, to meet public needs, there's something about that that is fundamentally, like fundamentally not democratic and not accountable, right? If one of us in the room has more money than everyone, and you say, hey, I will do this thing. And interestingly, in almost all Western countries, we subsidize philanthropy, right? So we all will say, oh, you don't have to pay taxes on that money if you do it. So like all of us subsidize this sort of very plural conception of what public good is and what social needs are. So I think it's just good to like zoom out for a minute and be like, so how do we even define these things? What are they? And who gets to choose? Um, and I think in this room, we'd have a very hard time saying whether it's cruelty to orphaned puppies that we care most about, or cruelty to orphaned humans, or an environmental cause, 
or a mental health cause or another. You know, there are valid debates to be had here, and it's an incredibly difficult allocation problem. So, but there are all these organizations that deliver services in all of these areas, right? Products and services. And then lastly, there's like the actual point that often gets left out of conversations like this, right? Are like actual people, or I guess puppies in this case sometimes. I'm bad at drawing dogs and doing pound signs, right? But like the actual point of all of this, right? Like it's easy to get focused on the mechanics of the system, but like that's why this exists. So I think like, it's important to kind of look at that and then like we can hopefully use this as a way to sort of frame the, the chat we are about to start. Um, I had one quick comment um, that's just a sort of personal thing about Isaac. Um, he mentioned that he met his, uh, he did not meet his company or his social enterprise co-founder on eHarmony. Um, would you say that you have a, a life partner of any kind? Totally. <laughs> and what would you say your eHarmony equivalent was for that life partner? Um, so I am getting married to a Gates scholar in about a month. <laughs> so I think like that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> no. um, we're pretty invested in this community. Um, and then one other thing, also kind of about Isaac, right? So he, he started a, like a scrappy and then quite large and impressive social enterprise. Like I did, like I, I sold two social enterprises as a CEO, but mine had customers who could pay more money than it cost me to charge them, right? So they were essentially just businesses and we did kind of cool things on the side. And I think it's important to acknowledge, I think my favorite thing that, if you guys are familiar with the old sort of um, uh, Ginger Stair and Fred Rogers thing, that, you know, mm -hmm. that running a business where you can just sell stuff for more than it costs you to make it, it's hard, right? And succeeding that is hard, but doing it where social aims are a big part of it is in the same, as a sort of like Ginger Rogers doing everything that Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in heels. <laughs> And that's a really important thing to say, like, this is really hard. There's a reason why we haven't like, solved all of these issues yet. I think that's true on the financing side, on the delivery side, um, and so on. So, and I'll just end here with just one example, just because Helen mentioned this as an issue, that I've been involved with since 2008 when it started. Um, in my first year as a scholar here, I was actually gonna work on private finance stuff for impact investment that was return seeking. Then I got involved a little bit in venture philanthropy, which is exactly the kind of funding that's been discussed in each of these cases. Um, but there was a cool experiment going on in part of the United Kingdom that I, I hope remains part of the United Kingdom, Scotland. Um, <laughs> and so in Scotland, there was this interesting idea of like, hey, if government sets social needs, right, they also have social targets, right? And they, like, they, have, they understand what's missing in the country, what needs to be changed. And Scotland in 2008 had this issue where they have young people who are not in education, employment, or training, so-called needs, although we, I think we have better terms now, but, and they had 32,000 young people who were likely to be left out of their system, despite the fact they had a pretty strong social welfare system. They were like, government can't reach these young people. So they said, but you know who, who can sometimes are these often more locally embedded small charities and social enterprises. So they said, well, how about if we take a bunch of government money and then we mix in some philanthropic money and mix in some money from uh, like organized foundations and high net worth individuals all grants, so not taking any money back out of it, and say, like, well, what if we create a portfolio, like a venture capitalist would, of the organizations that are in the same places as these young people in a sort of coherent way that there's a pipeline of services that identifies and addresses and moves these young people into education, employment, or training. And they had a very clear target in a way that social finance often historically hasn't, right? They're like, hey, 32,000 young people, we know where they are, we're the government, we can help do this. And it was actually run by this third party foundation. And if you're interested in this, it's called the Inspiring Scotland Foundation. And since then, they've spent something like 130 million pounds, um, almost about 80% of it public money, but running it through the system where they have um, an independent uh, foundation actually administer it, and they work with corporate um, volunteers and pro bono people to provide all these sort of value added services and networking they were talking about. So it's one of these, is, and it was the first in the world to do this. It's now being piloted in a number of other countries. Um, and it's, I will just sum up by saying, it, it seems to be working rather surprisingly well. Um, and I've worked with 100 of the charity CEOs that they've done. I've worked with all of their performance advisors. I've met with their board. It's been, I've been very deeply engaged with them as a, as a research topic and as a thing that I think is quite cool. But it's just one more example of how um, I think government is particularly going to be a much bigger role uh, in the future of social finance. And I think it might be a great time to hand it back to Helen and then 
let the things get started because you guys probably have some awesome examples yourselves. <laughs> <laughs>